Welcome to Tail Learn Code. Here, there will be tales about software development, learning from each other, code to build solutions. And now your host, Chad Green. Welcome everyone. Hope you liked that new uh, uh, intro I had there. Um, still playing around with that, but uh, something definitely to, to try out. Got actually actual couple of versions of that, so we'll, we'll see what we end up with. So uh, just a couple of quick things I want to I want to show, and then we're going to go to the main thing of talking with Kevin Griffin. Let's switch over here. So uh, just a couple of announcements. So you know tonight uh, Scott Hunter will be joining us uh, at the Louisville.net meetup. Of course, the great part about uh, the pandemic is anyone can join us. You don't have to be in the Louisville area to join us. So um, this is you know this should be a really great talk. Uh, had a, a, you know, I, I was at a meetup at Tulsa uh, a couple weeks ago where Scott was at, and number one, his presentations are great, and it's great to see uh, what he had to do. But then at the end, he did basically an AMA, and he really did answer pretty much anyone's questions. Um, you know, so definitely, you know, check that out. Yes, I'm still using the papyrus uh, font. <laughs> uh, eventually, we'll figure something out. Uh, what we'll do there. Hey, Chris, how's it going? Um, okay, well, that's weird, but awesome that I'm, I'm now in your, your host list. That's great. All right, so sure enough, uh, Scott Hunter tonight. Um, definitely want to promote Copalooza. Um, that's why we're, we're here today on this particular stream. Uh, you know, we'll, uh, 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 you know, so Copalooza is August 19th and 21st. This is our 10th year. Uh, what, a, what a year to try to do something special because now I have to do everything differently. Um, but you know, I think we found some good ways to, uh, to uh, make it as close as possible to an in-person event while being online. Um, and, and sure enough, I mean, if you look, I mean, we've got a tremendous, actually I meant to go to speakers. Uh, we have a tremendous lineup here. I mean, you look at these speakers, these are a lot of the great minds uh you know in software development uh who will be here talking you know over those three days you know if you uh for those who, who get a ticket you know you will uh um you'll have access to all this uh, all three days so we're not doing any you know pre-conference only and so forth it's you buy a ticket you get everything for everything and you get access to everything i should say uh and on top of it most everything will be available afterwards to attendees uh, via recordings. Um, there are a couple that would not because of, of licensing requirements on, on their parts. Um, but other than that, everything's going to be uh, available, you know, through the, the website. And it's sure enough, um, on Taylor & Co., we are going to do a giveaway. So um, over the next couple weeks, uh, you know, the, uh, you can enter a chance to get a, a free ticket to Copalooza. Um, and obviously, this is also to help promote my channel, right? You know, as, as we're getting this going more and more. Um, so sure enough, here, let me you can type in the giveaway command and you'll get the link to uh, to this, you know, um, you know, so follow me on, on Tail on Code, you know, tweet some things out and, and so forth. And you, you get chances. Um, and as you can see, we have different point levels, you know, how many chances you get depending on what you do. All right, then the final thing, and, and today is the first day of this, uh, but we're doing our speaker series. Um, and I tell you, it was awesome, the, the, uh, the turnout I got on this. I, um, I sent an email, and by the next day, I had all the slots uh, selected. Um, I actually now I've got speakers saying, I really still want to do this. Can, we, uh, can, can you add more slots? And we will. Uh, I just won't add them at this time, uh, because I still want to do some coding. <laughs> So I don't, I don't want this to become an all interview show. <laughs> uh, but so sure enough, Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, actually I already have one more I need to add in. So even the Tuesday before Copalooza, uh, you know, we have a great selection of speakers here again. And, and most of these are really good friends of mine. There's a couple of folks here who I have not met yet and I'm really looking forward to meeting. Um, and, and sure enough, so we're, we're gonna start with Kevin. So let me go ahead and bring Kevin on. There we go. And I'm gonna look at, I do have it open here. Now I can see that it's, it's open there. Uh, so great. So uh, Kevin, to make sure uh, we still have your audio. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Hi. 
I've been, I've been on the screen the whole time. time. I've, I've, I've been in the little picture. Yes. picture so. I, I, I did notice that. <laughs> it's funny. I, so with Skype, you get two windows. <laughs> Uh, uh, so you get a, you know the main window, and you get the smaller window. Uh, I think that's NDI that's doing that because it's showing you what is actually focused in NDI. Uh, <laughs> I noticed that. I just decided not to move it. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I, was, I saw myself on screen and went, "Oh, I should, I should, I should pretend, pretend like I'm paying attention." attention. <laughs> I was waiting to see some weird you know, response or like, "Oh my God, what he's doing?" <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm sitting there picking my picking my nose. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so sure enough, I've known Sean for, I, I don't even know how, how long I've known him, uh, probably close to 10 years, um, uh, probably about eight years or so I've known, I've known Kevin. Uh, and, and sure enough, I will say, I'm going I'm to do a shout out to Shevin, Shevin, to Kevin, uh, uh, and make sure I type this in right, because I'm horrible typing in uh, uh, Twitter name, or Twitch names. But so You still got it wrong. Oh, for heaven's sakes. What did I get? Yeah, it's uh, one Kev Griff. Griff. There we go. Uh, there you go. <laughs> see, that's why I have the, the links on my side. I, I don't have to type that in. So, so Kevin also uh, streams most days. Have you did you have you streamed? Uh, days? I've been taking a break just because okay. of current, current events. events. Uh, sure. Um, that's yeah. yeah. Just, just concentrating on some client work and. and not, 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 trying not trying to put myself, myself on a pedestal, pedestal. Uh, uh, but, but here, here I, I am on a pedestal. pedestal. Yeah, well, yeah. I gotta admit, I, I, I debated that, right? Yeah. Um, you know, because like you, I do a daily stream. Uh, um, and sh sure enough, for those who don't know Kevin, um, he does do a daily stream. Uh, actually, it's one of the ones I really enjoy. Um, as long as I'm not in a meeting, I will almost always turn it on uh, when I see it come on. Uh, and I, I did think about that, right? Uh, now, with yeah. that being said, I mean, sure enough, I try not to go very political on, on the stream for obvious reasons. We all have different yeah. opinions. Uh, and that was part of the reason why I decided to go ahead and continue on. Uh, I did make a little bit of mention of it, partially because I, I look this way. I mean, what, you know, my general attitude about all this is why do we have to be jerks to each other, right? Um, you know, I, uh, hey, uh, Matthew Groves, thank you for uh, for your raid and, and uh, welcome everyone coming in from there. Uh, so, uh, so Kevin, we just got uh, nine new viewers from uh, from Matthew's uh, uh, raid. Oh, they're tired of learning about Couchbase, and they want to they want to listen to me. Matthew's We're... having some interesting <laughs> questions. I, I was listening into a little bit of his. Uh, uh, he was getting questions as to you know, well, why would I use uh, Couchbase? Why why not use yeah. uh, SQL Server? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so everyone's saying I'm echoey on. Uh, so I don't know what's what's, what's up with your. your your, your setup, setup Chad. Chad. Let's uh echo, 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 echo. I lowered it a little bit. Let's see if that helps a little bit. All right. But uh, uh you don't accidentally have me on two inputs. inputs. That, would that would do it. I do have you on two inputs. Okay. Oh, technology is just awesome. Let's <laughs> uh OBS, OBS is, is great. It's like, it's like I'll just, just bring, bring all the inputs, inputs in. <laughs> I, you know what we're gonna have to do with it today? Because I, I know what I'm gonna have to do, but I'm not gonna be able to do that live. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to mess with uh, the Google XLR for these interviews. Sure enough, Kevin is my first one. I, I've, I'm interviewing here, um, so <laughs> he gets my be my victim. Learn, Learn the hard way. way. That's, that's right. right. That's Exactly. That's, that's, why, that's, that's why, why I volunteered. If you're going to have issues, you might as well have, have issues with me. me. Yeah, Matthew's saying, good job breaking it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all on me. Because uh, um, I, I, sure enough, I even did a quick recording right before we went to stream. I didn't, even, I, I wasn't paying attention. I was just paying attention. I had audio. I wasn't even paying yeah, attention yeah. to the quality of the audio. Um, but now I know that I, I know what, I know what I can do. Uh, <laughs> They're saying you sound like you're on a, on a uh, voice changer. <laughs> hey, everybody. Uh, I was gonna say, I, I have a problem sure. with this mic. Uh, so, so this mic, mic takes XLR, XLR or USB. USB. Mm -hmm. um, I, I use it with XLR, XLR most of the time, but a couple times I use it with USB. USB. If, if I hit the cord wrong, wrong it, it goes, goes into like a 
Barry, Barry White, White, like deep, <laughs> like deep blues <laughs> voice. And it's like, okay, okay. I, don't I don't know how, how that happens over USB, USB but it happens. happens. And uh, we, we record, record a podcast every week, and, and it's happened a couple times during the podcast. And it's like, um, well, all right, let's let's stop. Let's, Let's fix, fix the, the cable, cable and start, start recording, recording again. again. So, so weird when it happens. Now you're getting egged on to hit the cable. <laughs> Except for your your XLR, 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 XLR yeah, you're not do it. I've tried. <laughs> So, uh, so all right, let's let's talk real quick about you. So, all right, so, yeah. Tell us about tell us about you. I mean, who you know, who are you? All right, I mean, who other than I? an awesome speaker, who are you? Uh, so, so I'm, I'm Kevin, Kevin Griffin. Griffin. I'm a 10 time Microsoft MVP. MVP. My focus is mostly in ASP.NET Core, uh, Microsoft Azure, and I build web apps. Uh, that's kind of my passion in life right now. I'm an independent, independent consultant, been doing that for about nine years. years. And before that, I worked for consulting companies. I worked for Symantec for a couple years, or it's a couple years, a couple months before they decided to lay everyone off. Uh, I've had a you know a, a pre, pretty well-rounded career uh, up to this point. Been speaking in the community since 2007, and I've run a bunch of conferences. I've run a user group for 11 years. Uh, I've been trying to just be visible and active. And, and teach everything, everything I, I know. Yeah, yeah, no, that's cool, and that, that's really awesome. You know, ten-time MVP. I mean, uh, I know I know you have some differing opinions about the MVP program, which I don't disagree with you on, on, on a lot of that. But uh, uh, still, that's awesome. Ten years of, of yeah. doing it, and uh, I mean, that takes dedication, right? Uh, um, I do know, and, and you don't fall in this. I mean, some people kind of get MVP, and even though they're not really doing any much, they still get nominated for, you know, or, you know, yeah. re-up for MVP, but you're definitely not on that side. I mean, I, I see you around a lot. Um, sure enough, I mean, like last year, I think I saw you like four or five times, right? You know, through my travels, right? You know, just being in the same place and, uh, which is great. And, and, and so I'm curious, why do you speak, right? I mean, what is your reason for speaking? Uh, so, so let, let me go, go back to my job at Symantec. Um, so, so I just, just came out of college, and I got a job with Symantec. So they're the Norton people, Norton Antivirus, Norton Security. If you haven't heard of Symantec, um, you have not been in computers long enough. But uh, it, was a, it was actually a really cool dream job for me because I was out of college, and they brought me on as a junior software engineer. And, and I worked, worked uh, on a part of the semantics we call Decomposer. And uh, specifically, specifically what it was is a library built into the Norton suite that would, that would take container files, files like, like zip files, files or any file that can contain other files. files. And that it would extract all the files for the security suite to, to scan. Uh, a very, very important piece of the security suite. suite. Um, I was, I was on, on that team, team for three, three months, months, and we, we had an all-hands meeting. Uh, so, so everyone, everyone in the building went downstairs into this big room. room. The, the vice president of Symantec was there basically saying, uh, so, so, so we, we can, can make more money, money you're, you're all fired. Uh, uh, and, and we're closing this building down, and you will have a meeting a little bit later to collect your severance. Uh, which, which was really, really kind of cool, cool for me because I'd only been, been there for three months, months but I got a like four month severance. Oh, there you go. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. So, so then, then I went and got another job and I, I had a really good season uh, <laughs> doing that. Uh, so I went to my next job, which was a really great little consulting company working on government contracts and stuff. And I, I had like this mental shift having my first job out of college, realizing that Job security is not a thing. There is no such thing as job security unless you build your own job security. So I started looking around in the community. Just uh, or This is back in 2007. So I'm looking for resources where I can just network, build up my own skill set. And I hadn't even really considered teaching anything at this point. I just wanted to meet people and learn. Uh, I discovered a user group about two hours away. So I live in... The Norfolk, Norfolk, Virginia area, area if you know, if you know where, where that is. And, and about two hours, hours north of me is Richmond, Virginia, our state capital. capital. Uh, there was a group there that I learned about. I had just started doing .NET, .NET in the consulting job, and I picked it up pretty quickly because I was a C++ guy from college. And 
uh, I was starting to pick up .NET. I'm like, I'm, I want to learn more about .NET, and let me find a community where I can learn more about .NET. Found the Richmond group, and I uh, had just recently gotten married not too long ago, and uh, asked asked my then wife, like, hey, can I go up to this meeting? I was a two-hour drive up, two-hour drive back. And I did it one month, met a couple like really great people, where if I said their names right now, you would go, yes, I know them. Um, but uh, I went up there, had a great time, learned a little bit, met some people, and you know, came home, did the next month. And what was great about the next month was I got up there, and the people that I met previously, they remembered me. And I just kind of jumped in these little conversations. And we just rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. And I was exposed to my first code camp. And back in the, the mid-2000s, the, the code camp was all the rage in the Microsoft community. Like every major city had a code camp. And it was just a free thing you could do on a Saturday where they would feed you pizza and you would learn about, oh, this really cool Microsoft tech. And I started going to a couple of these. Uh, so Richmond, there was one in Northern Virginia, there was one in Raleigh, there was one in Philly. I was just, I was going all over the place and just getting to know people and just being a part of this little clique of folks who, who organized and participated in these different events. And I thought, all right, I, I love doing this. And someone said, Kevin, why don't you try presenting something? And I went, well, <laughs> hold on now. I, I will show up. I will help feed people pizza. But I didn't consider it actually presenting. Um, and that someone talked me into it. So I did my first pre presentation at a Raleigh code camp back in 2000, probably like 2008, 2009 or so. I don't actually quite remember. It was, it's been such a long time. But I did that talk and kind of got the bug. And it was great for me to build, basically build a talk from just an initial idea, get the feedback from the audience. Because the audience will always ask you questions that you had never considered. And you take that and you go back, make the talk better, rinse, repeat, and deliver again. And, you know, the rest is history. I've run my user group for 11 years. I've run several types of conferences myself with a, a couple amazing teams. Um, and... You know, here, you know, here we are. Uh, awesome. Awesome. I think that's the real, and the real emphasis of my career has been teaching everything I know, uh, because that's how I grow more as a professional, and it helps. You know, we're all just one big family, so let's just help each other out. Yeah, you know, sure enough, Surly Dev. You know, he mentioned uh, it's a good click to be a part of, right? And, and, yeah. and, and uh, I definitely agree. I, I think uh, my speaker friends are some of my best friends. All right, yeah. and. Uh, uh, number one, I, you know, so I, I do travel quite a bit. Uh, funny, it's all on my own dime. Uh, um, it's, you know, I, uh, I've been asked by others, they're like, oh, so are you a consultant now? I'm like, no, no, it's just an expensive hobby. Yeah. But one of, the, one of the ways how I excuse it is just, you know, all the people I get to meet and, you know, and, you know people like Kevin Matthews in the, in the group uh, or, you know, in the chat, uh, Chris uh, uh, you know, Gardner's in the chat, right? I mean, you get to meet all these great people. Um, and more, I mean, you get to learn from them. I mean, I mean, number one, it's great when we go out for drinks and you know, and just have, you know, blow off steam. But then, yeah. you know, but then hearing, you know, being in the speaker room and talking about what we're all working on and, and everything. I mean, that's just it's just awesome, right? And it's it makes it well worth you know the money I spend to, to do all that. And, um, and it's funny. I think my wife at first she was kind of like, "Why are you doing all this, right?" And well, she still wonders why I, I go through all the, the pressure of it. But but I mean, your story is, is pretty close to you know, I mean, not close to mine. Mine's similar, but uh, uh, yeah. But the, the story oh, I told myself early on was uh, this is a process of becoming more employable. Um, now I had gone and started my own business, and the the catalyst for doing that was I had connections in the community and an opportunity presented itself simply because of my the, the people that I knew in the community. Um, I, I have to imagine that if I was uh, just a nine to five developer working for a no name consulting company in the area, um, not doing anything to, to get my name out there, present my knowledge, my employability goes down drastically. <laughs> Uh, even though I know a lot of folks in that position who are just like crazy smart and could outperform me in any 
uh, development task that you name it. But there's there's a different there. You go into a company like, look, I am very active in teaching what I know, and I think more importantly, teaching what I don't know, uh, and encountering these problems and just trying to figure stuff out. Uh, I think that gives you a level of employability that you don't get just um, you know, sitting, going to your job and then coming home and doing other stuff, I mean, even though I respect that. The whole reason why I have my current job is because of, of my speaking and running community. Yeah, uh, um, I wouldn't have been known by the person who I got hired by. Um, and I mean, he told me that was part of the reason. Because uh, we're a company that does education. They're like, we love the fact that, you know, you're not, I mean, we're not a tech company. Uh, but we love the fact that you're going out and teaching people, right? And and yep. so it definitely does make a difference. Um, so which makes me think about what. So now I'm trying to decide which question because I got, I got two questions coming in my head. One's been in my head. Yep. I'm gonna ask it, uh, but I'm gonna first ask the one that came up in the in chat. So certainly Dev mentioned, you know, uh, you know, unfortunately Twitch has lowered the value of attending user groups for me. So I, I'm curious because you know both of us run user groups, both of us Twitch uh, yep. generally on, on a daily basis. I mean, what what do you think about that? So I think it, the user groups are uh, never for the content. Uh, user groups are always about the people. Um, and because I say it this way, you you go to a user group and you're, you're watching someone present a topic. And they might be from out of town. They might be in your local area. But it's never about the content because you can get that same content or better content on the internet, on demand, at any time you want, um, want to go get it. So the, the user group has never been about the content, but it's about the people who show up every month, and you have a somewhat professional relationship with, or you might have, uh, you might be, um, you know, friends and go out and do other things that are not dev related. Having having that uh, friendship um, or just professional network. Yeah, I think is more important, and that's that's what gives value to a user group. Um, and I tell people all the time, go to your user group, regardless if you care about the topic or not. Just sit there and work on your laptop, but go there for the pre-meeting pizza or sandwiches. And not that you can do that now, but you know, go there and interact with people and learn where people are coming from because you never know when you will have the opportunity to help someone else uh, someone, someone else out that's in need, or they might have an opportunity to help you. Yeah. Um, stay for the after events meetup. Uh, like our user group, we always go out to a little Mexican restaurant around the corner, and we'll just snack on chips and chat, and just kind of unwind afterwards. It's never about the topic. Um, and I think in this case, where like with COVID, where we we just can't physically meet with each other until you know who knows when. But Twitch, I, I think, is the right replacement at the right time to start getting some of that sense of community uh, where I can go live, you can go live, uh, our friends like Surly Dev, um, uh, Matt Groves, uh, you know, Chris Gardner, we all go live and we bring, we, we just kind of open a window to the world where people can come interact with us and you get some of that same conversation um and discussion that it's not the same extent that you get at your user group or at your conference but it's a nice it's a nice thing to have now where we can't go out because look at the alternative if you couldn't go to a user group or go to a conference and you're just stuck at home well you're just stuck at home you're probably you're probably just talking to someone on twitter every every now and then but you you don't have that that real interaction um, I, I think there's a place for both. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, so I agree. even when we go back to in-person events, hopefully in the next, hopefully we can do it in 2020, but if not in 2021, we, uh, you know, we, I still do the Twitch thing because there are people that I'm not going to see at my, at my user group. And likewise, the people in my user group probably aren't going to watch things I do on Twitch. So there's, there's room for both. Yeah, you know, that's the funny thing. I mean, uh, so I, I just started Twitch last month, um, but I've been talking about it for over a year. It was just, um, so it, it wasn't in direct response to the pandemic because me getting on Twitch. Yeah. Um, so I've been wanting to do this for a while. It just, 
with the pandemic, that gave me the extra oomph to actually finally get it done uh, uh, because I couldn't go out and, and speak and, and get around. Uh, it's interesting, you know, talking about, and, and there's some comments on, on, the, on the chat about you know, your point of you, you don't go for the, the presentation, you go for the, for the networking, basically. Yep. And um, so here in Louisville, we have a, a, we have a group called uh, Code Louisville. And its whole purpose is teaching folks how to how to program. It's mm -hmm. it's a lot. Of, mostly it's and I should say mostly it's generalization. It's you know wait staff and, and you know low skill labor and they're learning. Hey, this isn't this is what I want to do the rest of my life. All right, yeah. I, want, I, I want I want something I won't say better because maybe <laughs> my brother has been has been wait staff his whole life along with several other things. He loves it, right? So I, I don't want to demean, you know, but the, but it's still right, right, to do something, you know, uh, different. And they have a, they've had the requirements, I think almost since day one, that their students must attend groups. And I forget the number, it's like two or three they're supposed to attend within the 18-week uh, the uh, program. And, uh, yeah, 12-week program. I think it's two or three they're supposed to attend. Uh, which, mm -hmm. as a user group organizer, is awesome. I get a lot of new new faces all the time. So I was having a discussion last week with the with the uh, director of Code Louisville, and one of the things we were talking about, he was, you know, so we have what's called Louisville IT Happy Hour, um, and it's kind of it's gone weird. It, it's been a pure social, right? Uh, it's been going on for about six or seven years, but uh, last year it's just been going up and down. And it just really hasn't gotten traction. A, I think a week before everything hit the fan, and, you know, and we had to stop in March. Uh, we were talking about okay, here we can do this, this, and this to to get people back and and, and everything. And uh, but when this happened, I said, well, let's go ahead and keep on doing them online, right? Yep. And sure enough, we just really haven't begun the attendance. And he's like, well, I really wish you'd have those because I want to point people there because that's really all we care about. We don't really care that they go and, and learn things from the presenters, although that's yeah. good too. If we want them to make those contacts, especially because you're talking about people who are new in the industry, right? You know, I mean, they're yep. still learning how to do it. Uh, so that what you said really resonates with me. Uh, Cause I mean, that's not the first time I've had that conversation with him, but you know, that was a recent, cause it was like, well, please don't, you know, we just got to start it back up. Cause they went through a whole grant issue and you know they had to change focus for a while now they're back to doing coding uh so it's like yeah no i really want to push people to to attend that I'm like, all right well you know because i i'm of the general belief if i can get an audience i'll 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 get it coordinated right and i'll find someone yeah. to be there and uh um so so the other question i was going to ask you i mean because you've been running user groups uh actually longer i've been running for 10 years so you've been running for 11 so you're longer yep. than i have how do, you, how do you get new speakers? I mean, what, you know, what are your thoughts of getting new speakers? I mean, it's great to have, you know, it's great to have Kevin Griffin show up, right? Yeah. But how do you get that person who's never spoken before? Uh, it's extremely difficult. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, the, I'm partially asking because I'm trying to figure out how to do it myself yeah. sometimes, right? It's, One of the biggest tricks is lightning talks. Um, so dedicating a meeting to 15-minute talks versus... Uh, in the .NET, .NET Microsoft crowd, we're used to like 45 to 75 minute talks. Um, and as a new speaker, that is super intimidating to, uh, even though it's incredibly easy to fill 45 minutes. Um, but if you've never spoken before, filling 45 minutes is daunting. Uh, and we have found that by just offering several slots of lightning talks, so you know, five to 10 minutes, talk about one thing and uh, just you know, go go as deep into it as you want to, but just teach us one thing. That helps tremendously trying to get new speakers out. Um, we will sit around and we'll workshop just ideas. Uh, one of the guys who co-leads the, the group with me, uh, he sat down and said, well, I could do a talk on um, LinkPad because I use it every day. I'm like, yes, talk about that because I don't use LinkPad. I forgot it was even a tool that did something useful. And he would get up and talk about this, but he uses it every day and he just kind of assumed everyone knew about it and everyone used it. And that's a horrible assumption to make, especially in our industry. You, you need to talk about these things. And uh, I just told people, what's something that you do every day that you think that someone else knows about? And 
uh, we and we've had really like basic, you know, call it like 100 level topics. But if someone can go deep into a 100 level topic for 15 minutes, uh, that's it. Actually, becomes like a two, three hundred level topic, mm-hmm. um, like string manipulation in C sharp. You can fill 45 minutes on that topic, and you can go really deep because you can talk about all the little edge cases. Like, well, use String Builder in this case. Use String Concatenation in that case. Um, you know, maybe you want to use Span because that's new and fancy. Uh, there's there's a lot of different ways you can talk about this one little topic, and when we bring that up. Uh, some of these newer speakers go, oh, well, what if I talk about this, this, and this? And you go, yes. <laughs> it's like, no matter what, the answer is going to be yes. Uh, like, because whatever it takes to get you up in front of the group to talk about a subject. Um, and another thing I really, I think helps is when you get someone new up there that's talking about a subject and they're, they're going to have that, they're going to be super nervous. Um, having... Just, just being, being a buddy, buddy. So, so being the person that sits there and just throws softball, softball questions at them uh, to, to, to kind of get them just talking freely about a topic. And that helps a ton, too, because then they go, oh, well, I can answer that question. <laughs> and so then they start answering. They start feeling more comfortable because the I think the one of the biggest issues for new speakers is that they think the audience is, is against them. <laughs> and... The, the, the if I, I say something wrong or maybe uh, I show some code and it doesn't work, that I am going to lose the audience. They're going to throw tomatoes at me and they're going to have this negative opinion of me. But the the truth is that the audience is there for your success. They want you to succeed. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that's written in at least one or two different books on public speaking. You, you This is not a you presenting to the audience. It's a shared experience discussing a topic and the audience wants you to succeed that's why i love live coding on stage because make a mistake on stage you now have anywhere between five and five hundred pair programmers helping you spot your mistake and they're not they're not criticizing you they're like oh kevin you forgot the semicolon on line 15 Oh, thanks. thanks. It, would it would have taken me at least two or three minutes to discover that. <laughs> um, so it's it's once you realize that the audience is there for our mutual mutual success, and uh, you you have a different outlook on on presenting. Yeah, no, I definitely so. agree. It's funny. I mean, um, I, I get a lot of that feeling from Twitch, right? The, the live coding in Twitch because you, uh, a prime example, the other day I was working on something and someone said, "Hey." If you did that, it'd be more proficient. Yep. yep. And uh, sure enough, it was a micro optimization. Yep. yep. I was like, but you know what? That actually makes a lot of sense. And, and um, yep. that's funny. I don't do very much. Uh, you know, of course, Chris is. I mean, he's a trainer by heart, right? So it's yeah. no shock that he loves coding. On, on, on you know, live coding. I gotta admit, I uh, uh, I do not do very much live coding on stage. But uh, also, I talk more about Azure. And so yeah. I, I do live demos. Your click, 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 wait. Exactly. I do a lot of live demos. <laughs> click, click, wait. But uh, a lot of times my code I've already written, you know, it's, uh, yeah. but yes, it is a lot of click, click, wait. Um, actually, I do a lot of Betty, uh, Betty Crocker stuff of, uh, <laughs> here, let yeah. me do this. And now let me go over this screen where I have it all built for you. <laughs> that's the, that's the art. Like live coding on stage is an art uh, because they're like 90% of live coding is ceremony. And then it's, like 10 percent of actual this is i had to write these 25 lines of code to explain this one line of code mm-hmm. uh and the the thing i've learned is that there's a fine line between how much you should just copy and paste in and talk about versus writing live um, so a lot of the talks i do i i actually end up writing the code and then doing screenshots of code snippets and saying, all right, let me talk through this bit of code because this is the one thing I really want to talk about. Mm-hmm. And But then I have the Betty Crocker example like you mentioned. It's over here. Let's pull it up live in the editor, and we can talk through it, and we can uh, manipulate it, adjust it any way we want to to try to dive a little deeper into this topic. Um, so definitely a... It's an art. It's and with that, the only that's, way that's one reason I like user groups over. I mean, I love speaking at conferences, but boy, I love user groups because I don't. I'm I'm not so time boxed. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, and that's. I mean, because you talk about you know, 
in a user group, you get that question and you can, you can go off on it, right? And uh, yeah. completely change your whole talk, right? Uh, but no, I, I also, I love your advice on, on, the, on the new speakers, um, especially the whole, you know, uh, and it took me a little while to learn it myself, but that the, the audience is actually there for your success. Right, yeah, they they yeah. they truly do want you to succeed. Um, now, with it being said, I have seen audience go the other way. Yep. yep. But it was actually the speaker's fault. Uh, yeah, yeah. I did have a newer speaker who thought he was too smart, and uh, once he was getting questions, he did not know how to answer. Yep. He yep. got frustrated, um, and, and and so so he started arguing with with the audience, and, and you're going to lose your your audience at that point. Yeah. yeah. And that's, and that's the, the key, key to a, a newer speaker to a versus, versus a more mature speaker, uh, uh, mature just being an experience and a more senior speaker, uh, because the people I really respect in, in the industry as public speakers, my, I love the question where they come back and go, that's a fantastic question. I don't know. Um, and the, and because that's a great opportunity because remember you have anywhere between five and 500 pair programmers out in there in the audience with you. I will open it up to the audience. I'm like, that's a great question. I can either go research that on my own and we can, we can discuss it later. Or does anyone just out there know, happen to know the answer to that question or at least know enough to start the conversation. And I love having conversations with the audience because that way you can tell they're actually paying attention. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's harder, harder when you have 500 people. When you, when you have, have like 25 to 50, it's it's, it's a lot easier. But it, that's, that's always been my key. key. Never be afraid to say, I don't know. Uh, because when you go into an event and you're doing a talk, even if it's a talk you've done 100 times, there's only so many types of questions you can anticipate and have the answer just kind of ready to go in the back of your head. But sometimes someone will ask you a question that's just so far in left field that you say, that's a fantastic question. I don't know off the top of my head. Let I need to go research that a little bit more. Because um, remember, like 99% of developers out there don't actually know how to code anymore. We know how to stack overflow exactly. or Google. Yeah. And so like, it is a lost like skill coding. The skill has been replaced with Googling. And like, we're, so I know enough to know what I don't know. And it's really, I, I still do it now on talks I've done 10, 15 times. Sure. Uh, someone will ask me a question. Go, That's a great question. I don't know, but let's, can we talk about that later? Um, yeah, you know, and that's a great tip is don't dwell on the things you don't know. Just get off that topic as quickly as possible. Um, and nine times out of 10, that person will come up and talk to you afterwards. Uh, and you can have that conversation a little bit more in a little bit more relaxed environment. Yeah, actually I had a really good situation last year. I forget where it was. Um, got a question I didn't know. And, and it started a little bit of a conversation, but it was one of my yeah. talks. Actually, a lot of my talks, I, I don't I don't put enough padding in there. Um, and that's one of my faults. I need to put a little more padding. But it, it was definitely a talk where I go the whole 60 minutes. Yep. And uh, um, and so uh, I was like, okay, well, let's, it, it, sure enough, I said, let's talk about right after this. And yep. actually, there was a group of like six of us who just went to a, you know, an area of the conference and, you know, and just started talking about, about it. And, you know, and uh, I think we all learned from each other. Right, because yep. of that, right, and that, that was just awesome, right, and and uh, um, and I was able to incorporate that, you know, into future talks, right. So it's, you know, now now I know that answer, and you know, now I, you know, I won't be stumped by that again. Uh, but more importantly, not only did I learn, but I think those you know six folks that were with me learned even more, right, because I mean, yeah. uh, because they were actually part of the thinking of it instead of just. Yeah. I, mean, I gotta admit, I go to sessions sometimes. I'm like, huh, you know, you kind of veg out. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that is one of the hard parts about a conference. You're, you're in there all day long for several days, and you, <laughs> it, it could be a little bit tiring. That's another thing that I've just kind of picked up over the past several years is that I never try to plan a 75-minute talk anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I, I plan 25-minute talks, and then I have, talk, I have things I can talk about additionally if I need to fill more time. Um, but the, the biggest thing I've learned is, and you were just kind of hitting on it, like humans just do not have an attention span past 25 minutes. Uh, so 
we and it's like if you, if you ever research, research the pomodoro, pomodoro technique you know 25, 25 minutes of work five minutes of rest it, it, the science is is pretty sound you do a talk where you engage the audience for 25 minutes and then you, you basically wrap up and you take that mental break you, if you have to fill more time that's where q a and interaction mm -hmm. comes into play but like, I, I've, I've stopped trying to build out 75 minute talks because you will kill yourself trying to fill 75 minute talks. And the people you need to worry about are the ones who go, I honestly need like three hours for this topic. And those are the people that you should question because they do not know how to concisely discuss their topic or break their topic up into subtopics. Um, and any person that says I need three hours for this topic, you should probably do a workshop. Um, no, I agree. You should do something that's that's more effort. If you can't break it into a workshop, you need to you need to scale back your your focus. Talk about one thing uh, and the two or three reasons why you might use it. Um, you know, focus on a problem and a solution. Uh, I think like I broke this rule when I was early on in my speaking career. I would do like. You know, zero to hero in jQuery. And <laughs> I love the series of just like cliche talk titles. Um, but I would get in and realize, yeah, the reason I could talk about this for three, four hours is because I picked way too broad of a topic. And it was and realize like, all right, well, I have to teach you about this, 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 and this, this, and this. And the answer is yes. For you to, to go from zero to hero in jQuery, you do have to understand all these topics that would take me four six to four four to six hours to to communicate. But what I probably should have been doing is picking a very small problem that jQuery would have fixed very well and talked about that, uh, because then that's that's a fifteen to twenty five minute conversation and not six hours. Uh, and, and I've, I've really, really I've, I've and it's a it's a, it's a mental game I still play now, where I'll look at a talk and go, okay, I want to talk about fixing one particular problem, and that is a 25 to 45 minute talk, and not here's it, here's a technology that you can solve a variety of problems with, um, and uh, those tend to get picked up more. In, at different conferences because you're very specific about I'm going to teach you how to fix this problem with this solution and everything in between. So when you leave, that's the action item. You have learned how to fix this problem with this solution and there's no there's no question. Um, so yeah, it's it's just the maturity of becoming a new new speaker to a more mature speaker. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. I mean I. Uh, yeah, but last year was uh, the year where I went crazy, right? I mean, I, I'd yeah. been speaking for years, but I mean, I mean, last year, like I, said, I did 20 some odd events, you know, so I was all, you know, I wasn't always on the road, felt like it sometimes, but uh, um, even just over the year, I saw how, you know, because again, repetition, right? And just doing it so yep. many different times. Um, and that's even, I mean, I do a lot of different talks um, because I just have a lot, you know, I work on, yeah. As an architect, I work on a lot of different things, yep. and, and uh, so I have a lot of interest. So you know, and sure enough, some will tell you, no, just focus on one or two things. Yep. Yep. Um, and, and I, I understand that that reasoning, but I'm like, yeah, but that's niche. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but but I'm you know, but I'm not a niche developer. I you know, again, my job requires me to do, doesn't require me to go. Uh, Awesome. My job does not require yeah. me to write the final solution. My job requires me to figure out what the solution is so I can have other people write that final solution. So because of that, yep. I'm, I'm involved in a lot of different things. Uh, um, so let's talk about your, your two talks at Copalooza, right? Okay. So, yeah. uh, what talks am I doing? I, <laughs> yeah, I know. What talks am I doing? So, uh, so sure enough, you're going to do your, uh, your, your spa with uh, uh, Vue.js. I know, yes. I know Vue is, you've definitely been a big fan of, of Vue. Yep. Uh, so let's talk about that one first. I mean, so uh, one, I'm curious. So, so why Vue over doing like Angular, like most everyone else does? Uh, so again, it's like the talk, uh, architecting that talk was solving a very specific problem with a very specific set of solutions. Um, um, I have been doing web dev for 14, 15 years. So I started with jQuery. When, when jQuery is how 
most developers got their entry point into JavaScript. Uh, we was like, well, I'm not going to JavaScript. JavaScript's awful. And JavaScript was awful. And jQuery made it not as awful. So we, we kind of came in there. Um, I have built production applications in Angular 1, Angular 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I think, I think that's where our upgrade, upgrade point stopped, stopped before we just said, screw this. this. Um, and, and then I built production apps in React, React and I built production apps in Vue. Uh, the benefit of being a consultant is that there's always new projects, <laughs> new opportunities to try things that you haven't tried before. And but make it, I, I loved Angular 1. <laughs> like, I, if Angular 1 had kept the path it was on, um, through the future, I would probably still be an Angular, you know, Angular JS developer. Um, but we had made the jump over to Angular 2, and I think it's more of an issue of when we jumped over. We jumped over when Angular 2 had basically they changed everything, um, and you ended up having to relearn an entire new framework, and nothing worked the way that you expected to. There was no good guidance out there on how to convert your application from. Angular 1, Angular 2. Uh, there was no guidance on how to architect an Angular 2 application, even though it was vastly different on the way than the, how you would architect an Angular 1 application. Um, so we did wrong. Like We did way wrong. And still to this day, I have to maintain this one application. And every time I go into it, I'm like, I have no idea what's going on in this app. Like It works, and we just try not to touch it. Uh, because uh, we've upgraded, upgraded it through a couple cycles, cycles and, and it's not, not worth trying to, to go back, rewrite, and fix it. Uh, uh, we just, we're not at that point. Uh, so, so for another application, we're like, well, we definitely, we definitely don't, don't want to do Angular. Let's, let's try React. React. And, and had, had gone, gone through and built a couple of proof of concepts with React, React and actually ended up building the, the real application with React with some actual battle knowledge going in. And... I think, I think React, React is, was, was really good, good until there's, there's a, you go, you go through React, React tutorials, tutorials and they're like, oh, this is amazing, this is amazing. And then when you start writing a real application, you hit these walls and go, what the F are they thinking? Um, it's like, why doesn't something as simple as a for loop uh, exist in a React template? And uh, if there's any React purists out there in the audience, you're probably yelling at me right now. And I know what you're saying, but that's okay. Go do your React. Uh, so <laughs> I, the, the kicker for me was, uh, so we had done this React app, got it out of production, and it ran great. Like, I'm not going to say anything about the end result with React. It was really good. Um, the, then we, I heard about Vue coming up and looked at some of the Vue syntax, and I was hesitant about Vue. But then I saw more and more people jumping on that bandwagon. I decided, all right, well, let me go ahead and, let me see what this is all about. So I looked at Vue and realized, all right, Vue is like all the good stuff I liked in Angular 1, and it's all the good stuff I liked in React. And it's in a format that's actually comprehensible, and I can I can work in it and know exactly what's going on. Uh, and so we built this app, put that app into production. Well, we basically have these apps out in production, and when you're consultants and people are paying high hourly rates, you usually go through this phase where you push something out in production, and then they don't. You do a little bit of just maintain to make sure everything's up and working, but uh, clients are not in a hurry to give you more money. They they want to wait and just see how things run. So we weren't coming back to these apps for a couple months. Well, a couple months later, the React app uh, client said, "Hey, can we?" Uh, start knocking out this list. Cool. Go into it. And realizing that even though I knew React, and we had built a React app, I had no idea what was going on in this code. And it was my code. Uh, and so I ended up having to like relearn the, the simple things in React that I probably should have just known uh, because it wasn't obvious in the framework. Uh, so the coming back three months later, smell test, uh, React, React failed, failed there, there. Uh, and, and this is strictly my opinion, and everyone's opinion is going to be different. Um, Vue, we had a similar issue where we uh, put it on the shelf and we came came back to it a little bit later. Uh, I picked up the Vue application, instantly knew what was going on, uh, because like the React app, we followed the the pack practices and patterns that people say this is this is how you build a good React app. We did the same thing with Vue. The Vue app is like, oh, boom, I know exactly what I'm doing here. 
Um, and in a couple cases, cases, it might have just been, been, I don't remember the exact syntax. And, and reactive was, I, I don't remember the pattern, <laughs> like because the pattern didn't make, it only makes sense when you're deep in it. Uh, when Vue is just like, I could show, and I show Vue code to new developers who've never done Vue before, and they know they already know what's going on. They're like, oh, okay, I see what's going on here. Um, so that's why I kind of made the mental shift that Vue was the way that I needed to move forward. Um, now, I'm building single-page applications, and uh, I'm using ASP.NET Core as my backend, and there's actually a slew of like just different issues for how you, because you're maintaining two different applications. Uh, and most people on the .NET stack building ASP.NET, ASP.NET Core apps are used to everything in one little bundle. My my backend code and my fronting code, they're all kind of like inter, intermixed and um, in between. And so they come into something like single page applications and they think that it will work the same way, that I'm maintaining one application, it's just a single page application, not a multi page application. Uh, and it, it cannot work that way. Like you will drive yourself nuts trying to get it to work and it's hack after hack after hack where uh, I, I ran into this issue with my React apps and my Vue apps where I basically had to take a step back and figure out What's the best way to architect these systems for ASP.NET developers? Like, I'm not focusing on Vue developers. I'm focusing on ASP.NET developers who need to support Vue front ends. And that's why I built the app and uh, built the talk the way that I did. Because I go in, I talk about, it's all question and answer. Here's a dumb question that Kevin asked himself, and here's the dumb answer to it. Uh, and it's one right after the other. And by the end, I hopefully have covered all the dumb questions and give you a sense of, you know, how do you solve this problem? How do you solve that problem? Um, and I think more importantly, introducing the problems to you if you've never been through them before. Uh, in the end, you have a fully functioning application that um, is easy to maintain because uh, you will usually have to maintain your applications three, six months, years down the line. So build it in a way where you can maintain it. Uh, so, so that's, that's where, where that talk did. And I did that talk at NDC London back in January. That was my last live event. And uh, it was the first time with the new structure. Uh, I think I got some really good feedback from it. Um, it's on YouTube somewhere right now. And But it's, yeah, basically picking a very specific problem and solving it with a very specific set of tools. And you, it, the audience is more self-selecting there. Um, so, so you don't, don't need to know anything about ASP.NET Core. You don't need to know anything about Vue. But, but by the end, you should know enough to put the two together. Cool. Uh, cool. That's the goal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool. So then your other talk is uh, your uh, better object mapping in .NET with, with Dapper. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, that talk, again, sp picking a very specific topic, a uh, very specific uh, set, set of problems. problems. Um, I, I use... Dapper in every so Dapper is a an object mapper for .NET uh, that takes uh, relational database queries and turns them into objects. Uh, it does one very specific thing, and uh, it's, it was built by the folks at Stack Overflow. So everyone uses Stack Overflow, and Stack Overflow, if you've ever read their engineering blogs, they are keen on performance because as many millions of hits they're getting per second. They, they need to be able to hit data and get get, get stuff back quickly. quickly. So, so they built a set of tools to make their job easier. And they're, they're all open source, so you can use them. And, and I, I love Dapper because it's solving the one fundamental problem I think a lot of C-sharp -sharp developers have, is when I make queries to, uh, uh, when I make queries to a relational database, so anything with an ADO connector, um, how do I get that result set and turn it into objects? Because result sets are useless. You have to manually go through them if you want to get the data out. You want stuff in objects because we know how to use objects. And Dapper does that in really well. So I wanted to build a talk where I just talk about the simple things that Dapper can do because it's literally in my toolbox for every new app. I'll go file new. Then, then add Dapper. <laughs> add, it's like, sometimes, sometimes if I'm not even talking to a SQL database, I'll still add Dapper and forget, oh, that's right, I don't need Dapper. Uh, it's, it's part of the template. 
Uh, so with this talk, I go through uh, half a dozen different use cases with Dapper. Uh, basically, and I'm getting ready to actually update the talk um, a little bit more to, to discuss the problem uh, because most developers' solution to how do I turn SQL queries into data is like any framework, uh, which is, again, my opinion, is a horrible solution to that problem because it's not letting the database do what the database does well, and it's not letting your code do what your code does well. So you, what you need is is a, is a contract between them, not letting one thing be the entire uh, interface. And I think any framework, uh, any framework is not ideal for that sort of thing. Uh, Dapper, I think Dapper lets you take advantage of what the database does well while still having that conduit into your code. Um, so, so this talk uh, is a DB object mapping with Dapper uh, is basically talking about why why Dapper is a solution to a problem that you probably have, but never never realized. Um, and the answer is certainly Dev's question. It is online in a couple different places. Um, actually, I, I have a link on my website. Uh, but you should go see it at Codapalooza because Codapalooza will have the new enhanced version of it. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah. So... Uh, does your stream let me add add links? Yes. Yeah, I All right. I turned off that moderation rule because that was just causing okay. more problems. <laughs> so, uh, certainly, Dev, I added the link to the chat. Um, I did. I did. I put the replays in there. Um, well, no, certainly, it's composers could be all online. I didn't put the replay in there. Oh, so sorry. I I will have to get the replay and put it in this list. But I have the replay in like two or three different places. Um, the old replay, like the old, uh, not current replay. You should go get the new, new hotness right. at Code of Pluza. And, and so, sir, sir, Doug, Doug, we're going to go good point, right? So the great part about the, I don't want to say great part. The benefit of a global pandemic is I had to, I had to take the conference online. So it's, uh, um, it's funny. We, we, we went through several stages of denial during all that, right? Uh, so we we said, oh, we're definitely going to be in person, and then it was like, well, we'll look what we do. Then it was, we'll be hybrid, and then 100% online. So, um, so the conference will be completely online. Uh, um, we're going to be using um, Hopin, which is a, a it's a newer system. Uh, um, Actually, sure enough, from the UK, that's actually where, where they're they're based out. That's where the company's based out of. I noticed that they have a lot of developers in South America. Um, cause like the salesperson I talked to was in, I want to say Argentina. Yeah. Um, but, uh, they have a really neat system because they built it from the ground up to be different. And their, their goal is actually to build out like, a, like an online venue that you would go to for all kinds of events. Um, which is allowing us to do some really neat things. Um, to include, I mean, like we were talking about, you know, you have that discussion afterwards, right? Uh, um, after a talk, when you as you as a speaker, you can say, okay, well, let's just create a, a an open space, right, and dynamically create that. And here, go go to this space, and then uh, you can have those conversations. Uh, um, although the other honest truth is, is, the session doesn't actually have to end in one hour because uh, um, they're all independent of each other. There's no actual physical room, so it's not it's not like I'm gonna kick you out to to get someone else in the room. <laughs> What you will lose is you'll lose your, your proctor. You know, if, if you go over an hour, you're gonna lose your proctor because the proctor has to go to another room. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah. So you no, never, never known rush, rush until you see that person in the back that holds up the five, five minute sign and you realize, <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> I, I won't Just... say where it was, but I was very <laughs> upset last year. Um, Oh, actually, it was this year, which kind of gives it away. It kind of helps you figure out where it was because I always spoke at so many places. I, w I was, yeah, I think it was this year. And uh, now I'm, I'll admit it, it was Code Mash, right? And the proctor had his timings off. And so I'm going along, and I, I mean, it's a talk I've given several times, so I know this talk, right? Yeah. I'm going along, and sure enough, I was struggling because I had a really bad cough. Right, and, and uh, yeah, finally got to society enough to do a presentation. 
But uh, uh, I'm going along, and all of a sudden, I should have 20 minutes. He flashes up the 10 minute card. And I'm like, crap. Right? Uh-oh. <laughs> and so I, 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 I'm like, how did I get so far? I mean, I had a couple questions, but I'm mean, not enough to throw me that far off. And uh, so I, you know, I ended up speeding some things up, taking a couple things out. I mean, again, luckily I've been doing it long enough that, you know, it didn't fluster me, but it, it, yeah. in, in my head it was. it was. It was completely blowing me away. And sure enough, that one was recorded for, for Pluralsight. So, oh, it, excellent. Oh, all, I know where you were. Yeah, well, I, I, already, I already said where it was. But, uh, uh, but so... Uh, we just was, went to the water park afterwards. And yeah. We were all done. So it was recorded for Pluralsight, right? And uh, um, when I watch it on Pluralsight... I'm like, it's only 50 minutes long. It's because he hit his diamonds off. I'm like, I knew oh, I had 10 more no. minutes. <laughs> but it, no. turned, it's, it turned, actually, I mean, sure enough, you talk about having the right amount of content. I mean, it, it really yeah. did boil down to it. That talk I've built, because I've had to do it for 45 minutes, right? And I've had to do it for 60 minutes. So it was yep. really easy. I was, I, you know, in my head, okay, I had to kept, I had to cut a couple slides out that I normally would have hidden I'm like, all right, we're just going to skip these because I'm apparently running a little bit behind. I want to, you know, especially because I was, uh, you know, Code Mash, they have two sessions over lunch, and I was one of the ones over lunch. So I'm like, okay, I definitely don't want you out late, you know, you know, when I'm cutting into your eating time. <laughs> yeah, never be the one up against lunch. You just, uh, well, like <laughs> that's there, not a responsibility I want. You know, you're you're just speaking during lunch. <laughs> yeah, I um, mean, I actually still got a good audience, which I was I was happy for because I was talking about Gremlin, and you know. Uh, and graph database. Graph database, I, I love talking about them, but I, I don't get as big of an audience. Um, and, and on your spelling, so, right? And it's. Yeah. I think give it another year or so, I, that audience is. Going I to have. Grow. Uh, uh, that's the sad part about everything getting canceled. I had a whole lot more Gremlin talks this year. Um, and I was seeing more and more people attend those talks. Uh, yep. Now, grant you, this was a bigger one, but so I was speaking at Ignite in DC. And I was talking about Gremlin, and, and my 15-minute talk, I had like 150 people listening to me, right? And, uh, yeah. um, you know, of course, now, 15 minutes, that is hard. Because <laughs> yeah. it yeah. literally was, Microsoft was like, hey, we're going to pick this talk. We want to pick one of your other talks if you can do it in 15 minutes. Just tell us which one you could do. And I'm like, okay, none of them were written for 15 minutes. <laughs> yep. uh, so that was interesting, scaling that one down. You know, my biggest tip for timing, uh, so sometimes you don't have a proctor in the back. Um, I, I have a Fitbit I wear all the time. Uh, whenever I go and do a talk, I will always set silent alarms for 10 minutes before the end of my talk. And so that's a, me- it's a mental reminder if I'm up there. Because usually I'm, if I'm doing a really good talk, I'm getting into it. I'm not in front of the computer. I'm, I'm walking around. Um, uh, this is a speaker tip I've picked up a couple of years ago is just be a moving target, um, and, and in, in be more engaging for people. Um, but when the timer goes off, it's like, Oh, I have 10 minutes. I need to start wrapping this up. And usually I'm at the right place to, to start wrapping up. But if you don't have a proctor that's holding up cards, Oh, you know, get a smart device that's on your wrist and set silent alarms. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, um, so norm, well, normally I turn my watch off because I get I get alerts yeah. the whole time. So I you know, I've learned that lesson. Um, I am not a good walker. Uh, uh, I don't I don't stay right behind the, the podium, yep. but yep. I don't I don't go very far. And it, it, mentally I'm like, okay, I need to be walking, but I, I don't. Sure enough, that that 15 minute one I did at ignite, uh, that was one of my better ones, uh, uh, where I did walk around because because it was only 15 minutes. I knew exactly what I, I didn't really need my slides. My yep. slides were uh, normally my slides are to remind me what, what I wanted to say. Yeah. Whereas in that one, I just kind of rambled for 15 minutes. Um, and the slides were just to almost as a backup to, to everything. Um, and the nice part was they had a really big clock. So you knew exactly yeah. <laughs> how much time you had left, which now great. I mean, you know, Ignite, they have a lot of money, right? <laughs> so yeah. It was crazy to see how much money they spent for each one of the cities they were going to. Yep. But uh, uh, yeah, I could do speaker tips all day. That's that's a lot. Of, that's a fun topic to talk about, especially 
uh, with a group of speakers because someone will always say, oh, I haven't tried doing this. And go, oh, that's a great idea. I've never thought about that before. Uh, no, it's, that's, I mean, not that it's always what we talk about in the evening, but that's one of the great things talking about in the evening is learning other yeah. people's yeah. ways of doing things. Because uh, I'm definitely, I know, you know, I don't do it the best way. I'm not saying I don't do it badly, you know, and, uh, but there's always a better way. Right. Yep. And uh, I'm always trying to, definitely always been trying to prove myself. And, and uh, I think most speakers are that way. I mean, there are some who are, I've been doing this forever. I'm going to do it my way. Yep. You know, but most, I think, uh, definitely. Um, and I think you can learn from most. Yeah. yeah. There's a couple I, there's I, a couple I know who I, I will not mention that you, you don't want to learn from. <laughs> I love going to big conferences. Uh, and so surely Devin mentioned NDC and I loved NDC. It was, um, uh, my first time in the UK. So I, I went, went there as a presenter and what I love about big conferences like that is that you are more likely to get some of the, the bigger name presenters just kind of stopping in your talk to listen, uh, because you're talking about an interesting topic and they're, they're always like the most gracious, uh, teachers. <laughs> You know, say that was a great talk. Um, yeah, I have a couple little pieces of advice for you if you're interested, and they'll always ask if you're interested because some people aren't. Uh, but it's always it's always actionable. It's always constructive, um, and I love love events when that happens because it's just you know helping everyone out and even the big speakers. Uh, you could do the same thing. Go, I like I have a couple questions. Um, the, and usually it just turns in, turns into advice and they take it and make their talks better because we all just want to learn from each other. That's, exactly. that's what this whole community is about. Yeah. I haven't had Don't a chance to just speak in, in your silo. So I haven't had a chance to speak in NDC. I, I've submitted it, but you know, I just haven't broken that bubble. Um, I am hoping that we can start traveling again this fall because uh, I am scheduled to speak at the uh, European cloud conference. Um, and I'm okay. really looking forward to that. That's, uh, it's going to be neat. It was actually supposed to be last week, um, and they moved it to end of October yeah. Um, yeah. in Nice, France. I mean, you know, not a bad place to be at the end of October, you know, yeah. <laughs> on the Mediterranean, you know. It's, uh, um, but, uh, but sure enough, I mean, I look at the list of speakers, and, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it, uh, if or anything else, just to hang out with, with that group of speakers. Um, but you know, to your point though, it was funny. Uh, I was at a talk and, and Jay Harris walks in the room mm -hmm. and I, I mean, I love Jay, you know, and, uh, and he walks in the room. He's like, Oh, I want to attend your talk because what you're going to talk about, I need to do. And I'm certainly like, you want to learn from me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I need to learn from you, man. <laughs> uh, but it was great. And, and afterwards, cause I asked him, uh, what did you thought? And he gave me some honest opinions. Yep. Uh, because Jay I, is that perfect type of person. Exactly, because uh, that was we'll the first time I gave that talk. Give constructive advice. Yeah, because it was the first time I gave that talk, and he gave me some great, uh, and I had given that talk since then, and it was able to implement those changes. I'm so, actually speaking at Jay's user group uh, this week, lasvegas.net. Oh, cool. Um, <laughs> online, yep. Doing the Dapper Talk. Well, there you go. <laughs> so if you need another reason to see the Dapper Talk um, on Thursday. So yeah, actually, I was I actually just talking to Jay the other day. Uh, gonna, he's going to be speaking in Louisville, well, in Louisville, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, very soon. Uh, um, and um, actually, he's not on the Copalosa list, but uh, I think he's going to be added in because <laughs> he, he's yeah. asked. He, he's one of those folks who who are always welcome. Um, but you know, the whole funny thing. I mean, for those who know Jay and Christina, they met at Copalosa, so so oh. it's, so it's a special event for them. I didn't know that was the event they met at, but yeah. that's, that's awesome, though. You're like a little matchmaker. <laughs> I got to admit, that is the fun part about running an event. Uh, you know, I've got like that, uh, like Michael Dowden, you know, who, who's gotten a good name for himself. His first conference he spoke at was Copalooza, right? And, awesome. and so, yeah. and so why, which is why every year I see his name, I'm like, it's, it's there's a special connection to that, right? And there's, there's a lot of folks like that, right, who uh, have done something for the first time or... Your first talk was at uh, Copalooza, Chris. I didn't know that. I I guess I assumed you would talk before that, because <clears throat> you were a trainer at that point, were you? Or am I? Or did you get training? Did you do the training sort later on? 
But yeah, exactly. I mean, perfect point, right? I, okay, yeah. So he was already a trainer, but uh, that was his first conference. I mean, yeah, you know, I didn't even know that, right? You know, it's yeah, it's uh, well, again, the, the awesome. I mean, this is our tenth year. Um, you know, we were we didn't even know what we were doing. We were just trying to do something special, right? And yeah, and then uh, I mean, because I mean, like a, literally a couple of days prior to everything happening, I was in a, I was meeting with the city. It, finally getting the city involved because the city's never been involved um, other than like, I mean one year I had the, uh, the mayor do a, a presentation but other than that the city's never been involved um, and of course I'm like part of the whole purpose of, of the event is to promote the city right to show off uh, you know what, all the great things we're doing in the city so let me ask you one last question because uh, you know I I do need to enter right around one I because I could go to other meetings, unfortunately. <laughs> um, no worries. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, your podcast, right? Because I, yeah. I actually have never listened to it, but I know it's definitely something different. So, uh, That's right. So I'm, I'm curious. So tell us about your podcast. Uh, so I have a podcast I do uh, once a week. Uh, well, we release two episodes a week. Uh, it's called Two Frugal Dudes. It's on personal finance. And we... So it's actually interesting. It's something that spawned from the user group community. Um, so my co-host, Sean Marin, he was my co-organizer on um, the Hampton Rose.net group that I run. And after every meeting, because remember the whole networking thing, we, we went to this little diner, which we don't go to anymore. And we would have pie. That was always our tradition after the user group, the group of people. Uh, it turns out Sean and I both have a mutual interest in just personal finance. So uh, paying off debt, building wealth, um, basically building a foundation for for future success. And we would sit around the table and we would talk about different things like, oh, have you read this? Have you read that? Have you tried this idea, that idea? And we learned that we were just dropping so many conversations to the table and we said well maybe this is a good topic for a podcast and we did we recorded five or six episodes did a release and then you know three years later we're almost on episode 200 and uh we you know we've learned a ton about this community but it's something that's not tech and it's introduced us to a whole new community of people because uh, the personal finance industry is massive, and there's all kinds of amazing people over there that just, again, teaching everything they know. And we we just try to do the same. Uh, so twofrugaldudes.com, we do uh, we we cover a lot of different topics. So our whole idea is making personal finance accessible for everyday people. Uh, so if you have no idea, if you, you know you have a 401k, but you don't actually know what your money's going into, you should probably listen to the podcast because uh, we try to demystify a lot of these personal finance topics. And so whether you're paying off debt or trying to just put some money in the bank or you're at the point where you're ready to invest in real estate uh, or something higher, we try to cover this you know, large variety of topics uh, and indeed mystify the stuff that's complicated because at, at its ground level, personal finance is pretty simple. Uh, if we're just not taught about it unless you go trying to learn for yourself uh, at a later age. So, the, yeah, two frugal dudes. Um, yeah, I've been doing that for three years. It's just it's a nice thing to have that's not tech. Yeah, yeah. I, I do yeah. need to check it out sometime. I, I, uh, I wouldn't say I regularly, but... Often I'll listen to like Dave Ramsey. You know, I really yep. like I like the way how I mean it's uh, very simple. I don't necessarily agree with everything he says. Um, I, I call probably, it Dave I probably the gateway drug to <laughs> personal finance. Uh, yeah, yeah, because, because for, for a lot of people, people uh, and that's how we got started. Is you if you only know what you learned in school or, or like a lot of times like people's parents just were not good with money, or like the world was different. 30 years ago, mm -hmm. 40 years ago, like you're, you could not, you could not know anything about finances and get into a job with a pension and be pretty, pretty well off. I mean, that is not today. Like today, if you're not putting money away for your retirements or for, you know, just for the future, you're setting yourself up for failure. Um, because, or, or better yet, not to make it political, you're setting yourself up to be dependent on the government. And that's usually not the best, like, in game. So, so 
let's <laughs> let's set ourselves up for for um, independence. Uh, and as software technologists, like we are not in an industry that is lowly paid. Uh, like even a junior level software developer should be making a decent living compared to you know the alternative working fast food or you know working in retail or something like that. Um, you should you should have a basic base income. And it's what you do with it initially that will set you up 20, 30, 40 years down the line. Um, so we want to we want to help people hit hit those goals. Uh, we're about financial independence uh, because financial independence will set you up to do so much more good in the world than being financially dependent. Oh yeah, on no, I definitely something. agree. Um, so especially uh, like the um, one of the biggest, um, I guess, reviews we got. Uh, so we have a, I have a person out there that I know and I respect a ton. He was talking about, he, he has debt. Uh, he, he's not, he's not able to freely give his money in the way that he wants to. And, uh, with the current, um, you know, environment, he wants to give to these different organizations that are supporting, um, uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, you have the bail funds, you have all these good causes that just need resources to continue doing the work that they're doing. And when you're in a position where you're fin not financially independent, you are not able to give to these things that you really want to give to. But when you are in a position of financial independence, your bills are paid every month, you don't have any debt, you are putting money away for, for retirement, you're uh, investing for future... Um, future wealth that puts you in a position to just freely give as much as possible. And that is a, that is a really good place to be in. And I want everyone to be in that position because it's just your life. Your quality of life is going to be way better than, than it was before. Uh, if you're paying car bills, credit card bills, um, you know, you name it, student loans. Uh, these are all massive problems in our society right now. And life would just be so much better if those were not, around so yeah that's i'll get out my soapbox <laughs> oh, no. no that's that's what yeah. I, I wanted to do. all right i mean it was uh like i said i think I, I think it's a great cause that you're doing there and um it really goes to i mean what we've been talking about just helping each other out right yeah um you're helping technologists learn technology you're also helping people just you know live a, a, a good a decent life right and actually be able to enjoy life um yeah. or more importantly enjoy life for a longer period of time Exactly. Part of the problem. People enjoy life, and then then they're they're in debt so much they can't enjoy life anymore, right? It's, yeah. Um, yeah. No, I definitely more than willing to to promote that. Even, like I said, even though I haven't even listened to it. I mean, it's just it's a great idea, right? One of one of our favorite interviews. Uh, I'm not going to give out his information, but his name was John, and John uh, he retired early. So this is segment of the financial independence movements called fire. So, uh, financially independent, retire early, uh, retire early, meaning like in your thirties and forties versus your sixties and seventies. Um, and so he retired early and all he does is travel the world with his family and they go to all these really cool, exciting places. And he, he doesn't work. Like he, he did the heavy work up front and now he's just living off the dividends. And uh, I think that's what I aspire to be because I love the work that I do, but I don't, I don't necessarily want to be forced to do that every day. I want to be more selective about the work I do um, and just concentrate on the things that, uh, that I enjoy, not the things that I do just to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. So like, let's make that jump. Um, and that's part of our, our philosophy. Let's set ourselves up so we can make that jump. Awesome. It's been great having you for the past uh, yeah. almost hour and a half. This has been a this has been a great conversation. Um, I have to figure out my audio. Likewise. Although I am curious on the chat if it got any better. I did tweak a setting. Uh, am I a, echoey? Because <laughs> uh, hello, I, I did find if I turned down the system volume, that seemed I was noticing in my headset it was better. Um, but I don't know if, how well that came over the stream. Uh, I'll definitely I'll check out the, the recording afterwards. Um, but again, I really appreciate, especially because you're you're my first one. 
So it was, yeah. uh, was, I really had no idea what I was going to do coming into all this. There's nowhere to go it up from this point, Chad. <laughs> like, yeah. Okay, so uh, Sir Ledet was he put on his headphones, uh, which lessened it before you did any tweaks. So uh, I got to audio dig it better. So, okay, great. So maybe, maybe did, apparently I need to not leave my system volume on full percent. Uh, which I might meet, need to be, you know, I don't normally have a whole lot of audio during my, my uh, other than my mic. Or yeah. maybe need to adjust that anyways. Well, great. Like I said, it's been great. I'm going to, let's go ahead. Uh, so Code Rush is out there. Mark Miller. Uh, always a lot of fun to watch him do what he's doing. Um, I mean, you were talking about someone who has a lot of energy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love Mark's, uh, his facade around his, his stream. Every time I go watch him, it's like, whoa there's a lot going on here yep. did i okay yeah there we go so so yeah we're gonna go over and raid uh, uh current rush again thank you kevin um again i'll be streaming again tomorrow 11 30 we'll be doing code again tomorrow um and then um thursday uh sean watzel who happens to be in the chat uh will be on on the hot seat and uh like i said nowhere to go but up from this point yeah. like sean is definitely <laughs> like above and beyond me <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> I give Sean a, lot, a hard time. Sean's a good friend. All right. Th thanks. And I'll see everyone later. All right. Take care, folks. All right. Yay. All right. And we're in. You see the raid coming over. There we go.